Hey everyone, we're Nick and Rachel. If you're new here and you haven't been following our channel up to now, typically you would be seeing videos of us traveling the world and logging our adventures as we do it. But this one is going to be a little bit different. As we travel through various different countries, we've noticed that there are certain things about each country which is a little bit different to what we're accustomed to in the UK and Canada. The reason that we have this channel is so that we can share our travel experiences with you and we also hope to inspire other people to travel more. With that, we want to share some tips and tricks with you that we have picked up along the way in each country so that if you decide to go to any of the same countries we do, you will already be armed with some knowledge and information that will help you in planning your trip and navigating your way around while you're there to make it easier on you. Today's video is going to focus on traveling around Italy. For anybody who has not yet seen our videos, then our itinerary was focused on Rome, Pompeii, Sorrento, Capri, Florence, Pisa, and Venice. The point is that we are planning on sharing with you may touch on some of these destinations, but we will also provide you with some generic pointers as we go through this video about the country itself. We hope that you find these tips and tricks very useful, and let's get the ball rolling with tip number one. You don't really need to carry much cash around with you. All major forms of credit card and debit card are accepted most places, as is contactless, so do carry a small amount of cash, the same as you would kind of in the UK or North America, but generally it's pretty much unnecessary and there are bank machines everywhere. So you can always withdraw money from an ATM with your own bank card if it's necessary. Generally speaking, most European countries have more or less the same amenities as pretty much any other Western country. And when it comes to places like supermarkets and buying groceries, that's absolutely no different. You will find supermarkets in pretty much most areas of most cities, and this is a very cost-effective option if you are needing to be a bit more conscious of budgets as you travel through Italy. The good news is that eating out is generally not as expensive as it is in North America or the UK, but just be aware that the portion sizes are a little bit smaller. The ones in North America, at least, have definitely got out of control. Also, make sure that you specify that you want tap water, otherwise they may bring you still or sparkling bottled water, which you would be charged for. Just as an example, we went out to dinner a few times over the course of our two weeks in Italy. And both times we ordered two main courses, two drinks and a dessert, and it came to 40 euros. Even if you were to convert that into Canadian dollars, it is far cheaper because in Canada, you would pay 80 to $100 if that's what you ordered when you went out to eat there. Speaking of eating out, and this really goes out to those of you who are watching from North America, Tipping is not an expectation in Europe. It is only if the service has been truly exceptional that you do it. The reason for this is that unlike servers in, say, the States, then servers do get paid a living wage, and so they are still able to manage to get by without tipping. However, if you are feeling generous or you do genuinely feel like the service has been exceptional, then you are welcome to leave a tip However, this is only really expected to be pocket change or anything up to about 10% of your total bill. Speaking of which, the price that you're shown for any item that you're buying, whether it be food on the menu or food at the store or clothing or anything souvenir related, is the price that you're going to actually pay. Tax is rolled into the price that is displayed on the tag or on the menu. Public transit in Italy, as with a lot of European countries, is actually phenomenally cheap. Generally speaking, most of the major cities have large metropolitan areas which are served by a nationalised public transport service. This means that the savings then get passed on to the consumer. And so when I was doing research, then I found that 
a lot of single fares in a bunch of Italian cities only cost you one euro fifty per time, which is obviously phenomenal. It is also worth noting that in a lot of these cities it is also possible to get a day pass. These would vary from city to city, but they do end up being just as cost effective depending on the number of trips that you're planning on taking around the city on that specific day or even in a specific week if that is how long you're planning on staying for. It is therefore worth researching and considering looking into before you go ahead and start immediately looking for Ubers or car hires to make sure that you're getting around. It is also worth noting that some cities are not really built for traffic in the same way as in North America, so it's actually possible that public transport will get you to a specific place a lot quicker than going in any form of car would. It is also worth noting equally, if you don't want to spend any money at all, that some cities are actually very, very walkable. Because a number of these cities were built in medieval times, the whole point was that you could walk there. And so you may find that in certain city centres, you can probably just skip transit altogether and just go on foot. Something quirky about a lot of European cities is that there are not free public toilets. Of course, if you go into McDonald's, they're probably free, but there are a number of paid public toilets, which is so different than North America. I think that they cost about a euro each at most Less to visit. It used to be a penny when my grandmother was traveling, <laughs> hence the phrase, I'm going to pay a penny. Just know that there are public toilets, but they are paid. However, to compensate for that, there are a ton of free public drinking fountains. So if you're carrying around a water bottle, you can fill it up as many times as you need throughout the city as the fountains contain potable water. It might be a little bit difficult to identify them initially, but once you realize where the fountains are, you'll be able to spot them. And there are fountains in most of the cities that we went to that offer free drinking water. Up next, we've got some city-based advice, and we will start that in Rome. Obviously, one of the main things that you're gonna go and see when you are in this stunning city is the Colosseum and also the Roman Forum. When you come to book this online, then you are given a timed ticket. So you are expected to turn up at the specified time and then that will give you entry to both of the sites for the next 24 hours afterwards once you have officially checked in. However, while it does have a maximum amount of time, it doesn't really specify kind of a recommended minimum time to go and check these things out. However, having done it ourselves, I think it's very fair to say that we had maybe a couple of hours pretty late in the day to see the Colosseum. That did not actually feel like it was enough time. We had the audio guide taking us through everything and we really wanted to absorb the majesty of the place and really take in all of the information that we could. Even with two hours, it still felt a bit rushed. So we would probably recommend spending minimum three hours in there so that you can get the absolute best experience. Equally with the Roman Forum, then this is much bigger as a site than you think it is. And there is a lot to see. There are signboards taking you through pretty much everything and explaining everything to you. So we would probably go as far as to say that you need to spend at least a couple of hours in there as well. So realistically, if you're truly pushing for time, then a minimum four hours for both things in total. But if you can stretch it to beyond that and really, really make a day of it, then we strongly suggest you do that. Of course, again, the ticket does last for 24 hours in total though, so if you do feel a need to split this up between one afternoon and one morning, then you are also welcome to do that as well. As with so many of these tourist attractions, they are 
very popular and busy, especially in the height of tourist season in the summer. We were there just beforehand. So you definitely need to book them in advance. And fortunately, I want to say almost all of them have the option to book online. So it's very convenient. Now the Vatican doesn't open up their bookings a year in advance. It might not even be six months in advance. However, I do believe you can book at least two months in advance. That's my understanding of it. I had good intentions to do so, but did not get around to it early enough, which meant we were really scrambling and had to book through a third party tour group and pay considerably more than what the actual base ticket price is. So just be aware of that with some of these sites. They do sell out, and so booking as soon as the tickets open up is most advisable. Otherwise, you may have to pay more and go through a third party. If you are planning on making your own way to Pompeii via train, as we did, then as you come into the station, you will be greeted by a number of people who will be offering to take your luggage off you for what seems to be a meager price of four euros per bag for the day. Sounds reasonable, right? Wrong. It's not reasonable at all. The reason for this is because actually it turns out that the historical site of Pompeii has free storage lockers available. It's just no one tells you about that until you turn up there. However, it is worth noting that these storage lockers are completely first come first serve. You cannot reserve them ahead of time under any circumstance. Therefore, what we would recommend if you are planning a day trip to Pompeii is to make sure that you get there just ahead of the opening time for the historical site. That way you can guarantee that you get your storage locker sorted, your bags are put away, and then you can just enjoy your time at the beautiful historic site of Pompeii. A lot of people are probably wondering what the most cost-effective way is to travel between cities within the country. One bus system that we used a lot over Europe in general is Flixbus. They have extremely affordable fares between big cities all over Europe and cover a vast distance and have a huge network. So when you're traveling between, let's say, Rome and Naples, I would check Flixbus or other similar companies to see what that price is because it's probably cheaper than a train. However, when you are then looking regionally, so smaller distances, for example, between Naples and Sorrento or Naples and Pompeii, Pompeii to Sorrento, because just so you know, Pompeii lies in between Naples and Sorrento, look at the regional trains. They are really, really cheap. So to get all the way from Naples to Sorrento only costs four euros 90. That is really affordable. So don't necessarily look to go from Rome to Sorrento, even if that is your final destination. It's sometimes worth looking at a bus between Rome and Naples, because those are the two big cities, and then look at regional trains to get around within smaller distances, and it will probably end up being cheaper. Due to its popularity, it shouldn't be a massive surprise that tours going from Sorrento to the Isle of Capri are pretty expensive, so it is definitely worth looking online to make sure that you're getting the best price. However, it can be a little bit of an experience trying to find the right thing for you, but it is kind of useful in a way because most of the ferry bookings are available through one website, which is basically a huge comparison website, which combines all of the available options from all available companies to take you over. However, what this does mean though, and these are things to look out for, is that even if you're booking with the same company, if you go for a crossing at one specific time in comparison to another, that can mean a price variation. If you're looking for the cheapest price outward and return, then that may also mean that you end up going between one company for the outbound and then a different company altogether for the return. It's also worth noting that 
they also stipulate different rules in terms of when you need to be at the ferry port in order to make sure that you physically pick up your boarding pass. Yep, that's right. Your online confirmation is not sufficient. You do have to go to the ticketing office at the specified time on your ticket to make sure that you have a boarding pass to be able to board the boat. And that goes for both ways, even with the same company. So these are all just things to bear in mind because we ended up booking through two different companies. Each of those stipulated different times that you had to get to the pier in advance. One said one hour, another one said half an hour. So it is definitely just worth bearing in mind. Obviously, once you are in Capri, then one of the best things to do, and certainly we took full advantage and absolutely love this, was to do an island tour. It was still an additional 20 plus euros each to take advantage of it. And of course, as with most things, because it's such a popular destination, it is definitely worth making sure that you book this online prior to doing anything. Do not try and chance it when you get to the island. You may end up either missing out or hugely overpaying on what you're getting. Three of the biggest attractions in Florence are the Cathedral Santa Maria del Fiore, the Uffizi Museum, and also Accademia Museum. And you should book your tickets online in advance for all three of these attractions. Otherwise, you are going to find yourself standing in a very long line, possibly still not getting in because every other tourist has booked in advance, so they have their specific time slot and they only let a certain number of people in at a time. So you're just hoping that people don't turn up or that they just haven't sold out of tickets and that the line moves. So book in advance online for all three of those sites. Having done this ourselves, we can definitely assure you and recommend Pisa as a wonderful day out. However, something we didn't quite realize until we got there is that actually there's a pretty sizable discrepancy in price depending on whether you want to go up the Leaning Tower of Pisa or you don't. What we ended up finding is that there is this ticket called Completa, which allows you entry into five different buildings, including a museum, um, a monastery, a cathedral, and a couple of other things. And that cost you just 10 euros to take you in. If you wanted to do that and get a Completa plus Torre, which then took you up the Leaning Tower in addition to that, then that is 27 euros per person. So that would have meant that if we really wanted to go up the Leaning Tower, which we weren't that bothered about, then it would have cost us an additional 17 euros per person in comparison to just going around the other buildings, which are stunning and definitely worth going into in their own right. So just a tip for anybody who's trying to enjoy Pisa, but is a little bit more budget conscious like we were at the time. Because at the end of the day, the inside of the Leaning Tower is not going to give you the same enjoyment as taking your funny pictures, trying to hold it up or lean against it or anything like that. You can still take those photos from outside and you don't necessarily need to go up. If you're wanting to go to Venice but are budget conscious like we are, then we advise you to stay on the mainland versus the island. Accommodation on the mainland is far cheaper than it would be if you were to stay on the island. But don't worry about that. There is regular train service from the mainland to the island and back. It only costs one euro 45 per person each way. So it's very affordable and it takes 25 minutes. So it's super fast. As I mentioned before, it is a regular service. So the best solution for anyone who's on a budget but wants to go to Venice is to just take public transportation back and forth every day when you're visiting. Obviously, one of the main reasons why anybody goes to Italy aside from the history and the culture is, of course, the coffee and the food. And so, obviously, if you mention anything to do with Italian cuisine, you immediately think of pasta and pizza and gelato, obviously, all of which are wonderful things, and we definitely tried some. Can confirm, well worth it, unlike anything you've ever tasted before. However, it is also worth noting that even in amongst all of those wonderful things which you can find pretty much all across Italy, 
There are a number of regional specialities that are also available, so therefore it is worth consulting with locals and asking them where they go to eat and also the sorts of things that are a speciality of the region that you're in. I believe when we were in Florence and we were doing our walking tour, we were told about Lambrodotto, which was this amazing meat sandwich, which apparently was an absolute must try. And that goes for pretty much every single region of Italy. They have something special that really stands out from the usual fare that you would get in most restaurants. So it is definitely worth doing your research and figuring out what things interest you. And that's the end of our list. We hope that you've found our tips and tricks helpful and that you can maybe use them and apply them to your future travels, but I'm sure we've missed something along the way. So if you have any pointers, please leave them in the comment section below so you can help out your fellow travelers. Thank you so much for tuning in and there will be more tips and tricks videos on the way for the other countries that we've visited on our travels so far. Until next time though, take care. And keep smiling.